Hello. Ooh, I'm loud. It's still morning. How, how is everyone's morning going? You feeling good? You all right? That, are you enjoying yourself? All right. That, that's important. I, um, so I'm, my talk is, is, is hopefully going to be a fun one. Uh, the history of crazy uses for our favorite program, which happens to be Blender. Uh, the other title that I was thinking about was um, use Blender for what? Because, you know, that's, that's what it is. Now, I, I do need to ask real quick, um, how, I show of hands in here, how many people in here, this is your first Blender anything, any event you've been to that is Blender related? So, oh, about, it's a little under half of you. So, hello, old faces, new faces. Yeah, I got something really cool for you, especially after lunch with the lightning talks, it's gonna be psychotic and awesome. But the really interesting thing about the Blender community and that you'll find out, and if you haven't found out this out already, uh, you should pay more attention because it's totally awesome. Blender gets used for all sorts of crazy things that you would never, ever kind of want to or expect it to, partially because it's free, partially because, well, it's, it's just that cool. And so this is, this is kind of a survey of that because I've, I've I've been around the neighborhood for a little bit. Um, Blender, not Blender, Ton coined this term. Uh, I am amongst the crew of Blender old farts. Uh, I started using Blender in 1998 before it went open source. Uh, somewhere between 1.6 and 1.8. So it was fun. It, it, we didn't have undo. Um, <laughs> and uh, that was one of the first things that happened when Blender got open source. So that's, you know, Good things happen when you open things up. It's just the way that works. But because I've been doing that, I've, I've had the ability to see things going through over the years, attending Blender conferences, seeing things at SIGGRAPH, um, and you know, I also happen to have been writing Blender for Dummies. That's sort of the thing that I have done. In addition to uh, working with Autotroph and the CG Cookie folks and, and these sort of things, that's what I do. Uh, I've written the all five editions, and actually, uh, that's the only plug I'm gonna do that happens to be coming out on the 30th of this month is the fifth edition and it's like 700 pages, 750. But, enough of that, please. Okay, good, yeah, Blender gets used for all kinds of things that we, that we know about here already, right? Media entertainment, TV, film, gaming, those sort of things, marketing, advertising, 3D printing, archviz, industrial visualization, these sort of things. Yeah, we know those things. 3D gets used, not just Blender, but 3D gets used for all of these sorts of different things. And, and it's cool, it's great, but that's not it. Because it's free, because it's awesome, Blender gets abused and used for other things. Like you saw Synther's talk yesterday talking about the, the uh, open source bionic, or not bionic, prosthetic leg. It felt like bionic, it was kind of awesome. Uh, we know that NASA uses Blender for lots of cool things. Someone was telling me yesterday about, uh, telling me or I heard from somebody else, Blender being used to design heart valves and that's just from here, right? There's all sorts of really cool things out of it. And so just to, and it's not, it's, it's awesome. And so I've, I happen to have done a few of these wacky things, right? So just to give you a little bit of context, most recently uh, I designed my own tattoo, a little photogrammetry. I photo scanned my leg, then I uh, retopoed it, and then I baked the texture from the photogrammetry thing to my retopo. Then I sketched on my leg, pulled it into another file, uh, pulled it into, I think it was my paint at that point, painted off what kind of one I wanted, showed it to the tattoo artist, and she's like, sweet, I know exactly where to put it, and it's right there. But pulling my pants up in the middle of this would be kind of weird, so later, yeah? Um, also, a little bit less recently, but still recent history, one of the things that I've done with the consulting stuff I do with the Orange Turbine is we were, I worked with Dr. John Denning, who was talking yesterday about, uh, we worked with Elio Labs to make this automated tool in Blender, basically a wizard, to help a artist, a designer, make custom face masks for uh, Elio Labs to reduce eye bags, right? It's, it's a sort of a cosmetic sort of application for it, but we worked and used Blender as the tool to do that design work and really make something that would take an artist a full day to do one, be able to scale somebody who is not as skilled to do that in a couple of button clicks. And I did some stuff way back in 2012 with AI training. Um, I was approached by some folks at, some nice folks at Honda Research Institute uh, to train 
they wanted to have an AI system recognize pedestrians. They didn't tell me if it was for targeting or avoidance, and I didn't ask. But uh, basically, they wanted a humanoid character with a Python API. Ha! Huh, what can you do that with? You can do that with Blender. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm responsible for the AI apocalypse. Sorry. Uh, Oh, sorry, I didn't show up nice. That joke didn't work. But it's not just me. There's all sorts of crazy, wacky ways that Blender gets used. How many people remember Dr. Epilepsy? Yes, Dr. Epilepsy is a fantastic little Python add-on. It makes it easier for you to use Blender because it makes you force yourself to focus. It's a cool tool. It's been around. They've actually done updates over the years from the ver earlier versions pre to, uh, by 2.5. And it actually was a gift with, with Blender 2.5, I would say, because you couldn't do that with the Python API beforehand. OK, so let, let me get a little bit serious here. One of the more common places that you're going to see that, that, that I'll say the oldest use, the oldest user of Blender to use it for what it was not at all designed for was that guy right there, and I don't see him here, which is good, because then he'd yell at me. But I met Tom in 2003, and he'd already been doing this for a second, but he was using it as a PowerPoint replacement. He, all of his talks were done in Blender. Actually, some of them were done with the game engine. It's just, that's what he did. And it was, it was like, oh, I, I'm not entirely sure that it validated it for the intended use, but that's totally sweet. I love it, it's great. And that sort of was one of the things that sort of really, really got me energized about, okay, this is, this is a free tool that people can do whatever they want to be able to do with and make it work, and it actually functions and does the job surprisingly well. You know, it's always the question, what's the best tool, the one you know how to use? Well, when you got a Swiss Army chainsaw like Blender, you, got, you can do a lot of things. One of the other really old ones that's really cool, happened not long after, Bl well, a couple of years after Blender got into uh, open source, does anybody remember DTP Blender? It's a fork by Alexander Irwin, uh, otherwise known as NTERF, uh, famous for the cube with interesting lighting for way back in the day. But this was a version of a fork of Blender specific for desktop publishing. It lasted until 2013. It's a cool little tool. Lots of fun things going on with that. Um, Again, and since then, there's been other forks, right? You've got things like B for Artists. You've got uh, the, the individual forks that are used for uh, render engines or uh, people tearing away half the interface just for the one specific thing you want. The Blender app stuff that, that was uh, not introduced but talked about a couple years ago, it's all, it all sort of fits in with that. So it, the ideas started way back there. And of course, science. Blender gets used in all sorts of fun places for scientific stuff because, well, scientists don't have money, apparently, especially ones in academics, right? And so one of the longest running projects for science-related things is button BioBlender, which just recently last year stopped because GeoNode's just that damn good. And so they, this is meant for viol, um, uh, visualizing, not violating, that'd be weird, for visualizing the various different types of uh, biological sequences at the microscopic level because it's a lot of data and you want to be able to, re to manage all those resources. And it turns out that a lot of conventional tools that exist, one, can't do it. They're not designed for it. Blender's not designed for it either, but because it's open source, you can do a lot of cool things to make that sort of stuff happen. This, is run by Monica, this was run by Monica Zope from, uh, I hope I pronounced that right, in the... Uh, of the group of the, I'm sorry, the SciViz group of the, uh, the Institute for Clinical Sci uh, Physiology. Wow. And I believe, I recall, and that was in Italy, and I believe one of our, uh, a good longtime Blender person, Mike Pan, was working on that as well. It was dis discontinued, but you can still see the website, which is totally awesome. Another fun science use, this one was another one called AstroBlend, dealing with gigantic sources of data for astrophysics. This was by uh, Dr. Jen Nyman, Nyman, Nyman. Uh, and basically a separate part of, I think it was actually a fork of Blender to handle gigantic data coming in from satellites for managing astrophysics uh, simulations and visualizing all of that data in such a way that it actually makes sense and looks pretty. It's not the only one though, we've got medicine. medicine. Medicine tends to have more money, but they still love to use Blender because it's being used for all sorts of really cool things. Because again, being free isn't just about dollars and cents, right? It's about the freedom to be able to do whatever you want and make these tools work for you. So 
orthopedic surgery. One of the things, this is, comes from a number of, uh, Vasily did two different talks at two different Blender conferences about orthopedic surgery planning and actually mapping it out. So the actual talks, if you ever go watch them, little sort of disclaimer, there is some blood and guts in there, but it's still really fascinating using 3D printing and uh, uh, MRI scans and basically remeshing all of that. And then 3D printing the actual drill guides for, for drilling into bones and doing all sorts of crazy things like that. And he's not the only one that does it. There's actually an add-on now from Leonard called OrthoMesh. OrthoMesh 3D that does that. And they, they, they have sort of commercialized Blender as a product for helping do orthopedic planning. And that's sort of, oh, did I skip one? I might have, dang it. So there's another one in there that I, maybe is I'm out of order, but that's okay because it gets used for dental and related things as well. So this is a mouth guard. This is actually, was given as a talk at a Blender conference, oh, 2017? Oh, it's right there on the slide, I should have read that. It was given as a conference in 2017, and it's actually for customized 3D printing mouth guards done by uh, Richard Van Vanderost. And that's basically, you take a scan of the mouth, make a custom mouth guard for sports fits and that sort of thing. It was actually introduced as 3D mouth guard, and not too long ago, it got rebranded as ClickFit. And of course, if you're talking about mouths, we're also talking about dental work. So Blender gets used a lot for dentistry, not just because um, it's free, but there's an interesting thing that happens. When you deal with somebody, a lot of the dental tools that exist are kind of CAD-based, right? And they really think of motion and movement linearly. Well, we're humans, right? We, we move things around all of our bits and pieces, even the ones that feel like they're fixed, they move organically. They're subject to acceleration and deceleration, just like anything else. That means things like the animation system in Blender actually benefits modeling how things work in even slow moving bits and pieces. So Patrick Moore has been a big part of doing that. He's in a number of talks at Blender conferences. Definitely check that out with the Blender for Dental stuff. And just sort of inside, the, he's not the only one doing that. There's a lot of people who started to see this sort of application for reusing and abusing the animation system to take up the deficiencies that you don't, that are in your traditional sort of CAD systems that are used for, for that sort of stuff. Moving forward, whew, I'm, there's, I told you there's a lot of crazy uses here. Archaeology, lots of fun things going on with archaeology. And it's, it's one of those things that has progressed forward. You see, now you're starting to see actual academic papers published about the use of Blender in these sort of things. And they're not just things that were at like the Blender conference. So we had, um, was it Nicholas Schimmel yeah, in 2016 was using it for 3D scans and giving talks in, in a, I think it was a Blender Nation article about doing that, showing some Sketchfab scans of that for um, taking archaeological sites, doing area spaced scans of that. Um, Martin Kussel did another talk showing off, this is actually a, in 2019 a talk. We've got Elsa Petrus, I saw this as an article on there, and then some, ooh, did I say it? Oh, cool, good. And then uh, Santa Ty Porter, that's 2022, being used for just mapping out what sort of ancient civilizations, archaeological digs, and those sort of things work out with. It's really, really cool. Now, I do have a special section in here, and I don't see him here, but it seems that there's a special circumstance where there's just stuff that's done by Delay. Uh, Delay Felinto, who's with Blender Foundation, he has done a number of really cool things. So in 2014, he was involved in this project with uh, Benoit Belosi on, uh, nope, that's the wrong one, yeah, uh, with, to do chore drone choreography, right? That's commonplace now. A lot of people do that now. It's one of the first places I saw that that was done. Maybe it was done that before, but Delay was involved with doing th those sort of things. And then 2016, there's a really kind of monumental moment where they did a prosthetic beak for a macaw printed in metal. And that was done with Blender. And that was a Cicero Morais with, man, I have to get these pronunciations correctly, but Cicero with, with Delay worked together to make that happen. I mean, the fixed, you know, a bird can, could actually eat and drink and work again because what thing people did with Blender. It's awesome, it's so cool. And <laughs> this is one of the fun ones I like to talk about. Uh, I refer to it as being Blender adjacent. So around, uh, Daniel talked about Cosmos Laundromat. They had to render that. It was a very beautiful little thing. They had to have render farms. And so Carnot Computing stepped in and said, we're going to give you render, render systems. And they happened to have this particular kind of render system that each node would be put in and be a space heater. 
it's still in production. It's still happening. They still do that. They're, it's a render farm that is, uses a space heater. That's, that's, again, it's not all Blender, but Blender was one of the things that benchmarked that whole idea. So Cosmos Automat, yay! It's, it's, it's fantastic. Wow, long story short, <sighs> Blender is one of the most versatile pieces of software in the world. You can do all sorts of cool things with it. Um, the only thing that maybe gets used and abused more than Blender might be spreadsheets. And I don't think that's necessarily a compliment to spreadsheets. Uh, spreadsheets are they're, they're horrible things. I've seen, I've seen DTP spreadsheets. No, don't do that. But if you're going to do that with Blender, that's fantastic. It's great. The thing about that, though, is it's not just because of great engineering on, on Blender. Blender's great. There's a lot of really good forethought that went into it. And it's not even really the fact that Blender is free that does it. It helps, but the real reason? It's you. You are the people that are using it to do these things. Random folks from all over the world grab this piece of software, and in return, it grabs their imaginations. Then they, you, make something awesome with it that no one else saw coming. The community is really the killer feature for Blender. And that's really kind of the awesomeness about it. So thank you all for being part of it. And I'm really, really stoked to see the next crazy wild thing that comes out of this.